Well, it's Holy Week. We're coming to the end of Holy Week. And all of it will be very climactic on the day we call Easter when we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, isn't that really exciting? Now, isn't that really exciting? And sometimes I get a little disturbed and I try to understand it. As a father with little children at one time and now grandfather and looking at all the other little children and I don't want to be a, a killjoy of sorts, but I do get troubled in my heart that sometimes we get to looking at the Easter bunny and the Easter eggs and well, it's such a momentous day on the Christian calendar that we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord. In fact, some consider the greatest preacher since the apostolic days, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, once said that if he had a choice between not tasting death and going up in the rapture or dying and then being resurrected, he said, I think I'd rather die and be resurrected than to go in the rapture and never taste death. And he said, it's because that's the only way that I can know how it was on that first Easter when Jesus opened his eyes in the tomb and went out. So he said, I think I'd rather die and be able to share in that experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. But nevertheless, we're going through a really tough time in the United States and in fact around the world right now. Ultimately, we will get through it. My mother had a little sister that back in 1918 died during the Spanish flu. And by everything that I can read, read the Spanish flu was far worse and more devastating than what we are facing today. Of course, we've got all sorts of medical technology and medical procedures and therapies and medications that they didn't even, even dream of having back in those days. Uh, but uh, I know we need to pray for each other and lift up our country and lift up our loved ones and friends. We know that God will protect them against this terrible, terrible plague. Now, this is what we call now, let's ask Dr. Hunter. Any question on any subject that you want to ask me, I'll do my dead level best to give you an answer. I'll do my dead level best to give you an answer. Any question on any subject, and of course this is a biblically based program, so I hope you're looking for a biblical answer instead of some sort of mathematical or chemical equation and look at me and wanting a answer from some physics professor, which of course I'm not. Because I hope you understand, you're either looking for a common sense answer, which I'll try to provide, or you're looking for a biblical answer. And I'll try to do both of those. Because it is Holy Week, someone asked me this question. And, and by the way, this program, let's ask Dr. Hunter, is your program. It's your program. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the questions that I get, and you can leave a question either in the comment section on Facebook or if you see this on YouTube there, or you can private message me if you like. But the program will be based around your questions and I'll give you my answers concerning it. Somebody wrote me and said, I'm a new believer. Tell me the significance, the real significance that we have for Good Friday and then, of course, Easter. Okay, listen very carefully. Listen very carefully. Every church of every denomination needs to hear this. Every person that attends church, doesn't attend church, claims to be a Christian, doesn't claim to be a Christian. You need to hear this. There is only one way to heaven and there is only one gospel. There's only one, not more than one. If I stood up in front of a crowd of people of various religious persuasions and I said, 
The gospel is vitally important to get you to heaven. I could probably get a hallelujah, praise the Lord, out of everybody. But then I might have somebody in that crowd that would think that you can only get to heaven and that the gospel is, in order to get to heaven, what you can find in the Bible plus in the Book of Mormon. Somebody else might say, I believe you can only get to heaven and that the gospel will get you there. The true gospel means you've got to believe and be baptized. If you're not baptized, you're not going to make it. So they would say that's the gospel. Others would say, well, the gospel is really the fact that you get to go to heaven. And what's going to happen is when you get up there at the judgment, God's going to take a big scale and he's going to put all your works, good works on one side and all your bad works on the other. If your bad works weigh more than the good works, you're going to go to hell. If your good works weigh more than your bad works, you're going to go to heaven. I mean, you could have all sorts of, of ideas about what the gospel is, but if I said the gospel is extremely important to get you to heaven, everybody would say hallelujah, but they're not really in agreement. So my question to you is, what is the gospel? Now listen, listen carefully. There is one place in the Bible that definitively, black ink on white paper, tells us what the gospel is. I mean, in no uncertain words. Would you take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians? And when you found it, go to the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. I'm going to read it for you. And I want you to see how plainly Paul says what the gospel is. I mean, he's very plain about it. And this is what he says. Listen carefully. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you don't have your Bible, jot it down somewhere. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, not a gospel, not an idea what the gospel is, not what I think the gospel is. I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you've received, and wherein you stand. That's pretty clear, isn't it? By which also are ye saved. Boy, that's definitive, isn't it? If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. First point of the Gospel, Christ died for our sins. He paid the sin debt for us, according to the Scriptures. Now, it's very important to remember that. A lot of people have died for other people. But only Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. That's point number two. And that he arose again the third day, watch this, according to the scriptures. Now Paul said that's the gospel. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all of which was done to ensure our salvation. That is the gospel. That is the gospel. Paul said it another way in the book of Romans. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Didn't say a word about being baptized. Didn't say a word about your good works. Didn't say a good word about all of that. Now, folks, that's extremely important. We either believe the Bible or we don't. Okay, are you listening? Listen very carefully. Listen very carefully. Because someone asked me to explain the importance of Good Friday and Easter. It's all found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, that Jesus died for our sins. And that he did it according to the Scriptures, was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And that's what the Bible says. Now, you can't add to that, and you can't take away from it, or you've changed the gospel. Now, somebody asked me a second question, 
and I'm probably going to take a beating off of this, but I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway. Um, sometimes people will ask me about Bible teachers and preachers, and I am extremely reluctant to ever make a negative statement about any Bible teacher or preacher uh, who may disagree with me on certain biblical doctrines, and I may disagree with them, unless what they are teaching is categorically black ink on white paper wrong in terms of salvation. Now, if they are wrong in what they're saying about how you get to heaven, I feel as a good steward of God's word and the ministry that God has given me, I have to say something. I mean, I have to say something. So a second question that I got had to do with a very popular teacher, Joyce Meyer. Okay, now listen carefully. I would say that I probably agree with 95% of what this year lady teaches, and she has huge, massive crowds come to hear her. I probably do. But then I read one of her books, and I, I had difficulty believing what I read, and so I began to do some research. Because I want you to, I want you to hear me on this. Although I'd agree with 95% of what she says, you, you listen to my heart, listen to my heart now because I don't want to say a negative, harmful word. I'm talking about what she's teaching, not about her as a character or a wonderful, she may be a great, wonderful lady. I, I don't know her personally. could be a fine, wonderful lady, and I'm sure she's very sincere, but sincerity is not good enough. As I have often said, sincere people can be sincerely wrong. My mother taught me before I went to school that eating fish and drinking milk at the same time would kill you. Guess what they had in the lunch line on Friday at the 7th Street Elementary School in Cookville, Tennessee? Fish and milk. I just knew I was a dead duck. But as far as I know, nobody got sick. My mother was sincere, but she was sincerely wrong. So I, I mean, Joyce Meyer may be sincere, but I got to tell you something. In terms of salvation... Sincerity doesn't count. It's either biblical or it's not. And this is what she teaches. That Jesus came to the cross and died for our sins. Well, he did. I mean, I agree with that. And that we need to confess and believe him to be saved. I believe all of that. But where she gets off the mark, she has written it and preached it. That then Jesus in his spirit, while he was dead in the tomb, went literally to hell and was tormented by the demons. And between the cross and the fires of hell, our sins were purged. And if you don't believe that, according to her, you're going to die and go to hell. you got to believe it. So that's a part of her plan of salvation. Now, see, I can go halfway with her, <laughs> but that's not good enough. And here is the thing we need to understand. Even though I would probably agree with 95% of what she teaches, listen to me, dear brother, dear sister. If you're wrong about salvation, it doesn't matter what you are right about. Did you get me on that? If you're wrong about salvation, it really doesn't matter what you write about. And she says that Jesus went and took our place in hell, the fire and the flame of hell, the demons tormented at him, and our sins were purged. Now, there's so many things wrong with that I can't begin to tell you. First of all, there is no place in the Bible where it says that Jesus went into the fires of hell. It just doesn't say it. I mean, it just doesn't say it. The closest you can get to what she's saying, and it's not even close, and I've talked about it before. Some of you perhaps have heard me. Is that while he was on the cross in his spirit, he went and preached to the spirits 
in prison. There are four words in the original language for hell and interpreted into the English word hell. <clears throat> they have different meanings. One of those words is mentioned in Luke chapter 16 when the Bible talks about the rich man and Lazarus and the rich man died and was cast into Hades that we translate hell. But in that particular word, Hades means holding area. So there's a place somewhere, somewhere, that when a lost man dies, his soul goes into a holding area of fire and flame. But in that passage in Luke 16, it talks about a great gulf being fixed and the rich man being able to look over into a place called Abraham's bosom and there he saw Lazarus. Now, it's also a part of Hades. It's a holding area, but it's not a place of flame and fire. Hades is a holding area with two compartments. One is where the lost souls go, fire and flame, and they're held there till the great white throne judgment, and then they're cast into another place of fire and flame for all eternity. Another compartment, a holding area in Hades, which is what Hades means, is where the Old Testament saints before Jesus died at Calvary are held because they cannot go to heaven without the blood. Everybody, everybody that's ever been saved, Old Testament or New Testament, are saved by the blood of Christ. They looking toward it, us looking back to it. And the closest you can get to all this it's when Peter says that Jesus went and preached to the spirits in prison. And the word pre preach means to pronounce it as done. doesn't mean to persuade preach. The two words for preach in the Greek, one's to persuade and the other is to announce it's done. And so Jesus went to where these Old Testament saints were and said, I've finally done it. I have died at Calvary. Let's get out of here. And he took them all into heaven. There is no place in the Word of God where it talks about Jesus going to the fires of hell. Secondly, she talks about the demons tormenting him in hell. Hey, the demons cannot pull rank in hell. I mean, they're there to be tortured and suffer for eternity. They're not going to pull rank. We hear people talk about the devil's hell. It's not the devil's hell. It was prepared for him and the demons but they're all going to be suffering there. So there's no place where it says he went to a burning, fiery hell. Not one single place in the Word of God. Not one single place talks about the demons tormenting him. Not one single place where it talks about the fires of hell purging our sins. In fact, the Bible says that it is only by the blood that our sins are purged. I am telling you that is absolutely heresy. It's heresy. And so I would suggest to you that if somebody is wrong about the plan of salvation, it doesn't matter what they are right about. But that was a question. And so I tried to answer it. I'll try to answer it. Be firm, but at the same time, I can't recommend anybody, 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 anybody support a ministry that is wrong about salvation. I don't care what else they are right about. They just can't do it. So somebody asked me about the significance of Good Friday and of Easter. And then somebody asked me about uh, Joyce Meyer, and it just so happens that fits in real well with Easter, so I've answered that. And then somebody <laughs> asked me about Calvinism. I know there are people and more and more of them that are pastors and preachers and evangelists. I don't, I don't know how a Calvinist could be an evangelist, but I know there are. And there are teachers and professors of the Bible and so forth that are Calvinist. Now, for those of you that may not know, John Calvin was an extraordinary, brilliant man of a few hundred years ago. I think he was a man that had a sort of a twisted personality 
<laughs> he had somebody that disagreed with him on a biblical doctrine of his, and that man was declared to be a heretic, and you depends on who you talk to to what version you have, either that John Calvin consented to having that man burned at the stake or did something to have him burned at the stake or consented by simply not saying anything in defense of this man, but he had some sort of a contribution, I'll put it that way, however insignificant or significant, to the death of Michael Servetus being burned at the stake because Michael Servetus had a different view of biblical doctrine than John Calvin. But John Calvin, for all of the good that he may have done, very similar to what I said a while ago, for all the good that he may have done, he did a lot of things that were good. Man, I think he had a twisted view of who God is. And he has probably millions of people who follow him and defend him today. Because John Calvin believes that God doesn't love everybody equally, and yet the Bible says to me that God is no respecter of persons. And that when Jesus died, he did not die for everybody. He died only for the elect, who are the elect. Well, in John Calvin's mind, the elect are those that before the world was or universe was ever created, he determined in his mind certain people would go to hell, certain people would go to heaven. Those that went to hell wasn't one last thing that person could do to avoid going to hell and that God caused it to happen and provided no way of escape for those people. Now, I'm telling you, I don't believe that. And weird and as warped as it can be, in addition, John Calvin believed that, that you don't repent and pray in faith to Christ for salvation before you're saved, but rather after you're saved, you pray a prayer of repentance and faith in Christ. Again, I listen to me because I'm going to get hammered about it. Now, there's a video out there, and I don't, I don't refute it. In fact, I think somebody shared it at my last broadcast. Listen, listen carefully to me. If God, if John Calvin is right, and those who claim to be Calvinists are right, if God said certain certain people are going to go to hell, I'm going to cause them to go to hell and there's absolutely nothing they can do to avoid going to hell, and I'm not going to provide a way of escape for them, then I am going to tell you, as I've said many times, then God is a worse monster than Satan. How can that be? Because Satan wants everybody to go to hell, but can make nobody go to hell. But on the other hand, if God wants people to go to hell and they have no choice but to go to hell and there is no possibility of escape provided for him to avoid going to hell, then God is a worse monster than Satan. And I'm going to tell you right now, God is a good God. Now, I, I'm telling you right now, there's not a way in the world you're going to convince me. Not a way in this world you're going to convince me that God is a good God if he's a God like that. When Jesus died, I don't believe he just died for those that'll be saved. I believe Jesus died for everybody. You say, well, why didn't everybody get saved? Why didn't everybody get saved? Do you believe that, Brother Harold? If he died for everybody, why didn't everybody get saved? He provided salvation. It's up to man to receive it. Now, their answer to that is this. Well, yeah, but man can't do it. Now, I'm telling you, this is what they'll say. They'll say, well, you know, Paul said, we are dead in trespasses and sins. And what can a dead man do? A dead man can't do a thing. He can't, he can't decide anything. It's all of God and, and a man can't do anything. Why he can't repent? 
He can't call on God. He's dead. I got a great answer for that. You want to hear it? <laughs> Adam and Eve were created perfectly. And God said to them, the day you eat that fruit, you shall surely die. They didn't die physically. They lived over 900 years. They didn't die physically. But they died spiritually. And as spiritually dead people, they knew they had sinned without anybody telling them. They knew they had sinned. And they began to run. And they began to try to cover up their sins with fig leaves until the voice of God came walking in the garden. By the way, that word voice is the word logos. Remember, John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God talking about Jesus. That was actually Jesus back in Genesis walking in the garden. But that's a different story. But Adam and Eve, as spiritually dead people, knew they had sinned against God and were trying to do something about it. Yes, a spiritually dead person can do something and think something and say something. Or else how do you explain Adam and Eve? But I'm going to tell you right now, we serve a wonderful Savior. We serve a wonderful Lord. But I've asked that about Calvin. And there are a lot of things I could tell you, but basically it comes down to this point. Do you believe that God is such a vicious God, he would send people to hell, have it in his mind to go to hell and never give them a chance. There is absolutely no hope. And that all happened before the world was created. And so there was just, I just don't believe in a God like that. I just never will. Because the Bible says, for God is long suffering and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I just happen to believe that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's what I happen to believe. I had one other question. And that had to do with Job. And the question basically was this. Dr. Hunter, God allowed Satan to do certain things to Job, and they were horrible things. Basically, Dr. Hunter, I'm having trouble getting my brain around that. Do you think Job knew that God had done that? And um, how would it have made Job feel? Well, I think Job understood that because basically he told us even if God slays him, he's going to serve him. <laughs> He'd already made up his mind. He's like the three Hebrew children that were thrown into the fire before they went in. If we die, we die. If we, God allows us to live, we're going to live. Uh, it, this is my personal opinion about Joe, by the way. I've fought more battles than Napoleon, I guess, in my ministry. My wife one time said to me, said, why can't you be some little nice preacher instead of taking such strong stand? Why can't you just be a real sweet person and all that? I think she was saying it tongue in cheek. Hope she was anyway. But I just got to tell you, when I was growing up and I knew I was going into the ministry, I said, oh God, let me be a preacher like the apostles of old. When people met them, they either loved them or hated them. I think the worst thing you can say about a preacher is you don't have anything to say. <laughs> they, they don't take a stand there. I mean, my, my saying has always been from an early, early start in my ministry. I hope when I go to a town to be the pastor or go to be an evangelist, if somebody mentions my name, they better be ready to duck or pucker because everybody in the town is either going to love me or hate me. And one time years later, my wife said, well, how does it feel now that you've arrived? <laughs> so here's what I think about Job. Here's what I think. I think Job suffered terribly and he didn't understand but somehow or another, somehow or another, he knew it was better to serve God than to question God. Because he's admittedly said, though he slay me, yet I'll serve him. 
you know, somehow or another in the deepest pain of my life, and the times I feel the most abandonment, most lost. It's just a wonderful thing down deep in my heart in a place I can't describe just to know that he cares for me. That he cares for me. Well, we're coming up on Easter week, the end of Easter week. Got any old timers there? I mean, some real old timers. <laughs> Got any over there? You might remember this song. On that resurrection morning, when all the dead in Christ shall rise, I'll have a new body. Praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. Oh, isn't that a great thought? Sown in weakness, raised in power, ready to live in paradise. I'll have a new body. Praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. I'll have a new home of love eternal with the redeemed forever to stand. There'll be no more sorrow, no more pain. There'll be no more strife. Yes, raised in the likeness, of my Savior, ready to live in glory land. I'll have a new body. Praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. Well, I've come to the end of Let's Ask Dr. Hunter for today. Did I kind of dilly-dally around too much for you? <laughs> I hope not. I tell you, I love the people who watch and from time to time leave a comment and if you want a question that'll be answered on the next edition of let's ask the pastor all you've got to do now is to put the question down in the comment section and i won't mention your name i will not mention your name so whatever it is just remember that i won't mention your name did you notice i didn't mention anybody's name that asked a question and I'll answer your question, or you can send it to me, private message, and I'll do it there. I hope you continue to have good days in the Lord. One of these days, this virus is going to be over, and I've about decided, in my simplicity of thought, <laughs> I've figured out I'm, I'm smart. <laughs> I have figured out a way to overcome this virus. I have figured out a way. They are telling us to wash our hands with soap and to use some hand sanitizers when we don't have soap and water. Now, if that's good enough to take care of it, the first time you start to sneeze a little bit, drink some of that sanitizer, chew on a bar of soap, blow your nose on a piece of toilet paper, and you'll come right out of this. Makes sense to me, doesn't you? No, don't try that at home. <laughs> no, don't try that at home. <laughs> I don't believe it'll work. <laughs> but it was a good thought, wasn't it? So this is our second edition of Let's Ask the Pastor. I'd like to know if you enjoy this program. It's a brand new format. I'll take any question. It doesn't matter what the question is. I'll treat it seriously as I can and try to give you some comfort in it. Tell your friends about it. I hope you'll share this program. And don't forget, I need about 100 more subscribers. Would you just hit that red subscribe word at the bottom of the video? I'd deeply appreciate it if you do it. And until we're together again, this is Evangelist Harold Hunter, and have some good days in the Lord.